This morning we have a pre-recorded video, but we have a very special guest to introduce this video. Please give a warm welcome to GMARC. Thank you. Well, good morning. Welcome to Richard Thiem, who has been presenting here since 1997. I attended his first talk at Black Hat One in 98, and he has been a regular here. Uh, due to family health issues, he is unable to be in person. However, Richard will be doing a, a broadcast. I just want to say a note of thanks to him for his years of friendship. If you've ever had a chance to listen to Richard speak or interact with him, you'll find out he's probably one of the finest intellects in our community. And yet he never kind of became a hacker. He really was a priest in his earlier life and adopted the hacker community as his flock. And I think for that, we should all be grateful. So please sit back, listen to some interesting ideas from Richard Thiem for one of his passions about UFOs, alien lives, and the least untruthful things that he can say. So please over then to Richard Thiem. And welcome to UFOs, aliens, and quite seriously, the least untruthful things I can say about that. It's a pleasure to be back at DEF CON, although I wish I was there in person, uh, but could not be this year. Uh, so I'm going to do the best I can with one of the more unusual talks you're likely to hear this year, uh, exactly as it was requested by the review committee at DEF CON. Uh, you probably need to know that I've explored the subject of UFOs seriously and in depth and in detail for 44 years. Above all, I've worked with some of the best and the brightest in what we call the invisible college, uh, after Alan Hynek's coining of the phrase, to do academic research well and scientifically and with integrity and to base our conclusions on data and evidence and scrupulous observation, discarding all those that don't contribute to a reasonable uh, understanding of what we're looking at. I mention all those people that I've worked with because I'm going to quote from some of them in a little bit uh, because I asked them for their bottom line conclusions after working on this subject diligently and academically and in every way collecting hundreds of thousands of documents uh, over more than half a century. And these are good people. Uh, so you'll have to take my word for it. I vouch for them. Uh, a number of them contributed to the celebrated historical work to which I also contributed, UFOs in Government, a Historical Inquiry, which is in over 100 university libraries and is considered the real gold standard for historical research into the subject. So this is the most forthright presentation I can make on this subject, and I want to emphasize that it is about alien life by request because I'm going to tell you some of the conclusions we can make about the likelihood that UFO phenomena represents alien life. So you're looking at uh, me, now you're looking at the title, the search for alien life, UFOs, and the least untruthful things I can say about that. All right, let's begin by remembering where we are, what kind of universe we inhabit, what kind of cosmos. What you're looking at right now is a selection of just some of the galactic clusters in the universe. Now, a galactic cluster is a collection of galaxies, uh, often millions of galaxies, uh, often covering a huge span of which our Milky Way galaxy is merely a pinprick in its own, uh, its own galactic cluster. And I'm going to show you a still picture of that. Uh, this is Lani Akea. I hope I have time at the end to play a video. If not, make sure you plug Lani Akea, that name, into uh, a search engine and watch the four-minute video which illuminates how this was determined to be the galactic cluster in which we live. You will notice all the way at the end of that little white filament arm on the right is a dot that dot is the Milky Way. This cluster is hundreds of light years across. And the point I want to make is that Lenny Akea, the Hawaiian name for open skies or immense heavens, um, there are 100,000 nearby galaxies uh, in just this one cluster. 
do you really think we are the top of the food chain and the only sentient intelligence in the universe and that we are the first to learn everything, even though we've only had electric lights for about 150 years? Uh, as the universe counts time, we are barely up from the slime. And we have made significant progress very quickly. Uh, what you're looking at here is the telescope Galileo created and used to see moons of Jupiter, for example, and other things in 1609. So it's a little, little bit over 400 years ago that he discovered spots on the sun and the phases of Venus and hills and valleys on the moon. Now, this is what we're using the James Webb Space Telescope. You can Google the first images that have come from it. It gives us our farthest look, our farthest reach into the galaxy, uh, into the galaxies. Uh, we have just found, using James Webb, one of the oldest uh, formations of a galaxy in the early universe than, that we have ever seen. But this is going to help us because it is going to look at and identify exoplanets. Uh, that is, those that are likely to harbor life. But more than that, this telescope, I hope you can see it adequately, it's called the Roman Space Telescope. It's got a much, much bigger field of view. It's scheduled to go up on a, on a, uh, uh, a rocket from SpaceX in about six or eight years, 2027, 2026, 2028. And what it is going to be able to conduct is uh, areas of the sky will be viewed that are 100 times larger than the Hubble can see, 100 times. And it will undertake a galactic exoplanet survey designed to find Earth-like planets that is smaller rocky planets in the right habitation zone around nearby suns. And it's going to do this and find galaxies in the Milky Way a hundred times faster than the Hubble. Okay, so this is just to say we are on the cusp in our limited and relatively primitive technology ways to identifying planets where life has originated. That is coming, but we don't need to rely on that to know that there are other things suggestive of life in the universe. What you're looking at here is fo uh, two photos from McMinnville, Oregon in the late 1940s. And these two photos show uh, flying disks that the farmer, Paul Trent, uh, had no idea what they were. He took the pictures. He says he wished he never had because he was attacked and assailed and called a charlatan and a fraud. The kind of camera he was using uh, did not lend itself easily to the kind of photoshopping we can do today. Uh, and he wouldn't have known how to do it. He was a farmer in McMinnville, McMinnville, Oregon. So from the first days of the current UFO era, starting in the late 40s, uh, we have images. Uh, I refer you to um, uh, a YouTube video about the McMinnville, not only the McMinnville photos, but two videos. Uh, you can Google those. One is from Great Falls, Montana, and one is from Tremonton, Utah. And what they show are discs flying over an area where people happen to have movie cameras, and they took pictures of them. Uh, they did the best they could to identify them in every way. They went to naval labs. They went uh, to the Air Force. Uh, Air Force clipped some frames from one of them, the ones that showed clearly shining silver discs that, according to the camera operator, looked like shiny dimes in the sky. Uh, he rebutted every silly argument they gave for what else it might be. But this is to make the point that we had video uh, movies, we called them, of flying saucers early on. So we, we got to work on how we had to manage that. You're looking here at two photos, it's two among many, of UFOs. It's that basic. People say, why are there no photos? Well, here's a photo. Why are they so far away? 
Why? Because they kept far away. Uh, duh, right? So uh, these photos are clearer, perhaps. The modern era of the UFOs begins in the 40s with Foo Fighters during World War II. Those glowing balls of light you see uh, tracked our airplanes over Germany and Japan. We thought they were secret weapons of the Axis. They thought they might be secret weapons of ours. We learned after the war from all the documentation we could get our hands on that nobody knew what they were. There are good books on Foo Fighters. I am just trying to make the point that we had photographs early on, both movies and photos, by reliable people. These were taken by military pilots uh, of unidentified flying objects that are not explainable uh, in any other way. So that's why this statement was made. Uh, this is Nathan Twining, uh, a general, right, head of the U U.S. Air Force uh, Material Command, and he said, quote, the phenomenon reported is something real and not visionary or fictitious. And you can look that up in historical annals. Uh, but uh, this is the full communication. It's called the Twining Memo, but it wasn't a memo. It was a different kind of communication. And he said quite uh, uh, clearly, the phenomena is real and not visionary or fictitious. He described the size of them. And above all, he described the operating characteristics, extreme rates of climb, maneuverability, action which must be considered evasive when sighted by friendly aircraft and radar. In other words, whether inhabited by intelligent beings or robots, they responded, interacted with our attempts to intercept them. And it lends belief to the possibility that some objects are controlled, he said, always looking for the least common denominator of understanding, either manually, automatically, or rem remotely. And he added that they're metallic, they're circular or elliptical in shape. In other words, a classic flying saucer, often with a dome on top, uh, flying in formations, and no sound. No sound. We did not know in 1947 how to create vehicles, nor did anyone on this planet, that didn't have any sounds and that could fly like that. That's why Major General John Sanford, Chief of Intelligence for the Air Force, made this statement in the early 50s, credible people have seen incredible things. So others have described it, and I have referred to these before, but I'm going to refer to them again because these are important documentation, uh, important documentation, it is important documentation of what people knew and when. Hermann Oberth was Werner von Braun's mentor and the father of German rocket science. And he described, uh, let me back up to this one, uh, what they looked like. He said the appearances are discs, uh, sometimes happen, they're one on top of the other, they fly in a manner so that if the drive is acting perpendicular to the plane of the disc, uh, when they're suspended over a certain terrain, they keep horizontal. When they want to fly quick, they tilt and fly with the plane directed forward. Uh, they glitter like metal. They are dark orange and cherry red at night. If there's not much power necessary for the particular movement they're making, such as when they're hovering, suspended calm, then they don't shine much. But if they need more driving power, whatever it is, that sources their motion, the shining increases, brightens, and they appear yellow, yellow, green, green like a cop copper flame, and in a state of highest speed or acceleration, extremely white. And he went on to say, look, this is 1950s. The accuracy of these measurements can't be doubted. If there were only three or four, I wouldn't rely on them, but I've seen more than 50 from wireless sets radar, the American Air Force and Navy, they can't all be inaccurate. And this is uh, substantiated by our own Paul Hill, who worked for NASA for several decades, and he duplicates the observation that the UFO colors stem from energetic ionizing radiation generated by the UFO, which ionized the air. Uh, and he lists the colors red and orange, least energy, and so on, up to blue, the strongest radiation uh, peaks of nitrogen. So they confirm one another. What they confirm is that people are seeing the same things and that there are correlations between speed and intensity of ionization and the colors they manifest when that is demonstrated 
as they move extraordinarily quickly. So we want to know what they were. Well, here's a map. This was in Look Magazine in the 1950s. You can't see it well, but you can see all those labels. And each label is appended to a little circle that is around an Air Force base or a nuclear facility where UFOs were sighted, uh, were hovering, were looking like they were doing reconnaissance, looking like they were nosy, because that's where they showed up. And that's why Look Magazine and Life Magazine ran serious articles about what we were seeing. And it was news then. Uh, here's my favorite uh, headline, Saucer Outran Jet Pilot Reveals. It's in the Washington Post. It's not in the National Enquirer. That came shortly after these incidents in Washington, D.C. in 1952. And uh, you can see it. It was news then. It was news. And so here's another news item. Naval personnel drawing what they saw. A news item. That's the point. Here's another one. Uh, another flying saucer headline. Miami pilots spot eight saucers, et cetera. Hundreds in state in Indiana, England. To show you that it was a global phenomena. And this picture that you're looking at, uh, when there was a famous occurrence over Washington, D.C. in July of 1952. Uh, this is what it looked like to the pilot. He's the dot in the center. The others are the UFOs that surrounded him when he tried to pursue one, and they came closer and closer until his, uh, his high emotion, obvious from the recording he made, we have, of him speaking to the control tower. These were observed by ground observers, pilots sent up to chase them, as well as three different Air Force base uh, and with radar on the ground. This created a, a pretty big consternation. Uh, how do you explain this? Uh, this is when Sanford said, credible people have seen incredible things. Well, they approached it by appointing a panel called the Robertson Panel. It was convened in 1953, in January, uh, and it included uh, Marshall Chadwell, who was CIA Assistant Director of Scientific Intelligence. His concern was that UFO phenomena could be exploited by our enemies, especially the Soviet Union then, to incite mass hysteria and panic and overwhelm lines of communication required for early warning defense if their bombers were coming over the pole. That was the primary focus, a national security in light of how they could be used or manipulated by genuine terrestrial enemies. So that was a serious concern. We had to be on the alert for a preemptive nuclear strike by the Soviet Union. Uh, the panel met for about a day, 23 hours. Most of that time was not spent examining the evidence for the UFOs. Uh, we had conclusions like the Air Force's own photo reconnaissance lab at Wright-Patterson that said after several weeks looking at those films I mentioned from Montana and Tremont in Utah, we don't know what they are, but they aren't airplanes or balloons, and we don't think they're birds. And the Navy added, the UFOs are intelligently controlled vehicles. Uh, but their, their choice uh, as you might know, was not to explore it scientifically, not to validate and verify what, uh, <laughs> what they knew and others knew. It was to create a, a press release like this uh, with Project Grudge, which followed um, Project Sign, which followed the Robertson panel. We have investigated and evaluated blank uh, and, and have found nothing of value which would change. Our, in other words, no matter what is seen, put out this blanket denial that anything uh, is worth uh, worrying about. Uh, you get the idea. You know I've, I've referred to illusion, misdirection, ridicule as the primary legs of the stool of cover and deception. And uh, that's what they employed from then on until, and, and they had silliness like this, right? Uh, UFO aliens found at South Pole and so on. All kinds of crazy things were placed in print, and then the useful idiots promulgated that the way useful idiots on social media are promulgating all sorts of nonsense today. Um, now, the CIA concluded they're not a threat directly, uh, but 
Military personnel should be trained in the proper observation of flying saucers and programs should be created to debunk flying saucers uh, to the citizenry so they don't get upset. And that's the way it was until just recently. Now we have a change in the weather, right? Uh, now people are saying, uh, oh, uh, there is something to it. We can only speculate about the motivations of people who do not show their hands inside the places where these decisions are made. But it became news again. I showed you it was news. Then it was debunked for decades upon decades. Now UFO report says UAPs may be a national security threat. Why, said the CNN. 60 Minutes, which everybody trusts like Walter Cronkite was trusted, UFOs regularly spotted in restricted U.S. airspace. So we're back to the twining document, right? Actually, we're not because we have been researching this. We, serious researchers, for decades since the debunking started and pushing back against the debunking as a professional program to mitigate the impact of knowing that real UFOs are visiting us. And they are visiting. They're not taking off from Kansas. They are arriving from outside the earth. So they are back to the twining memo. But we've known all this since the 1940s. What have we, unprofessional researchers, but highly credible, been doing in the meantime? We have been looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of cases. Uh, we have lots of data. Project Blue Book, which they undertook, had over 12,000 reports. NICAP, the National Investigation for uh, Aerial Phenomena, and CUFOS, Center for UFO Studies in Chicago, has over 10,000 reports. MUFON and New Fork have over 100,000 reports. Most, 90%, are likely sightings of known objects, but many are not. And they were doing research that we didn't know about. Japan in France conducted serious investigations of UFOs uh, and got no cooperation from the UFO, all from, uh, from the United States. Um, Battelle Memorial Institute uh, conducted its own investigations in the 50s. We know we've been studying it. And here's the Battelle Memorial Institute analysis. 20% are unknown. That's all I want to use that to show that they knew from 1947 to 51, the result of serious study was that most were unknown. And then this 1952 incident happened. Uh, people were vectored in uh, to uh, approach a UFO that was coming in at 18,000 feet, sent strong signal, and it was traveling over 1,000 miles. We've clocked these things at zero to 14,000 in seconds. They don't fly the way we think of flying, aerodynamically in atmosphere. They move the same way in the same, with the same fidelity to their structure in space, in water, and in air. They don't fly. Something else is happening. Something is affecting space-time in their vicinity that we don't know how to understand or replicate. Well, in this case, they reported it to the Pentagon, and they said if another one comes in, fire on it. Uh, you know, so obviously it's not a hallucination, right? That's 1952, and I refer to that 1952 event. Credible people have seen incredible peop uh, things, and we're back to the Washington Post the next morning introducing the subject in that way. So... Heineck became disgusted, Alan Heineck, with how the Air Force treated him because the, he was being bypassed when he tried to be a consultant for the Air Force. And he made this statement when he created KUFOS in 73. The public, he said, was placed in the role of the enemy against whom counterespionage tactics must be employed. From my personal experience, he said, from my personal experience, uh, the public was placed in the role of an enemy against whom counter-espionage tactics were employed. I frequently felt those in charge did not consider people who reported UFOs or took a serious in interest in them and wanted data about them. They considered them enemies. 
And they didn't need reports. They had reports. They had plenty of sensors and observations and photographs. They knew this was real. They didn't need Antilly to say something landed behind my barn, scared the cattle half to death. Uh, this is the way my hero, Mobius, uh, in the novel that came out last year, uh, Mobius, uh, a memoir. It's called a memoir, but it's fictional because I couldn't write about an intelligence professional telling the truth about his experience unless I put it in the guise of fiction. A friend at NSA said that to me directly. He said, you can't ever discuss what we talk about in here uh, unless you write fiction. Fiction is the only way you can tell the truth. Well, thank you for that. And this was the result. It's highly recognized as a real terrific uh, tour de force. You can look at the reviews on Amazon, Mobius memoir. But I just finished its sequel, The Mobius Vector, which will be coming out soon. And Mobius says the real collateral damage was to civil society. Once information went everywhere faster than anyone could stop it, uh, the people we were protecting had to be treated as enemies because if they knew a secret, everyone knew. We had to invent false narratives. This was the origin of this distorted information space in which we all live now. The context of post-technologically revolutionary life uh, required that we do that, Mobius said, uh, my, my hero. Uh, and that's, he's a hero because he became a whistleblower in the second book, The Mobius Vector, is about his life as a whistleblower, and the third is coming out now. You might find them of interest. At any rate, illusion, misdirection, ridicule were directed against us, and I know that personally. But not just little people like me. Here's the general manager of the French version of NSA, NASA, NASA, and he said, there are campaigns of misinformation that destabilize, even ridicule those who treat the subject seriously. The American effort is deliberate and orchestrated disinformation. But why? Loss of supremacy, the top dog, uh, keeping potential acquired technology, if we can figure out how this stuff works, because you better believe that anyone who figures out how UFOs work owns the planet and a lot more besides. The technology is so far superior, according to Werner von Braun, to anything we expected to encounter once we knew that UFOs were real. Uh, so here's the head of NASA in France saying, they're treating us the same way they're treating you. And people like Helen Cutter, who was the first director of the CIA, said it's time to bring out the truth. Behind the scenes, high-ranking Air Force officers are soberly concerned. I could go on and on with quotes from the 40s and 50s before the, the hammer came down on people telling the truth about what everybody knew inside the fence. That's just the way it was. And just because they debunk cases doesn't mean that interesting cases went away. I refer you to these four. Look them up. The Minot case was beautifully explored at MinotB52UFO.com, a thoroughly documented account of our pilots encountering UFOs in the air and on the ground at Minot Air Force Base in 1968. Uh, skip down to Tehran, Iran, a DIA FOIA response details a dogfight between fighters and a UFO. And an Iranian general later went public at a Washington press conference and confirmed the event. We have the document from the Defense Intelligence Agency, and it is stated on the document that the case is of the highest credibility because when the Iranian pilot vectored in toward the UFO over Tehran, remember Iran was our friend then and had our best jets, he was told to arm his craft, and when he did, the avionics went out. And he had a curve around looking for a way to come to a landing. But once he was out of uh, a position where he could harm uh, or shoot at the UFO, the avionics returned. Uh, it sounds like, doesn't it? Uh-uh, don't, don't do that. Uh-uh, uh, we won't hurt you, but don't try that. Uh, those kinds of incidents are a lot more common than somebody being injured. So I encourage you to look at the Tehran UFO incident, the Minot incident, and a uh, fishing trip to Wisconsin. Boy, I wanted to give you the details about that, and I don't know that I'll have time. 
It was uh, a person I interviewed in depth. We have his account uh, corroborated uh, of a UFO that came down and went under the water when he was fishing. And how it came out of the water with water cascading off the sides, which were encased in a plasma, that very kind of plasma that ionizes the atmosphere around it. Once it was free of the water, it was gone. Uh, but it had to be free of the water. When they're touching the land or water, they use a different propulsion system. I'll try to give you more details about that if I can, if I have time. But, um, or write to me, you know, email or let me know through, through my contact information that you want to know more about it. And I'll tell you, uh, this was the head of the rocket division, Thiokol. I remember being up there when they were testing a rocket engine, uh, quite thunderous. Um, and he said, if the witnesses are accurate, it's hard to explain what they saw any other way than that they are extraterrestrial vehicles. And that's, that's where we are. Uh, that's the point I want to arrive at here. There's no way to understand this phenomena except as a manifestation of extraterrestrial vehicles. I list here just some of the kinds of conversations I've had. I've had... I would say several hundred, as have all of us in the Invisible College, as well as combing over literally thousands of cases to eliminate everything that didn't fit. And I hope I'll be able to show you a little bit about what we do with that, but time presses. Uh, recently, I made the simple statement to a colleague who had worked at the Pentagon for many years that they were real, that they have been here for a long time, and they constitute a national security threat. And my friend asked about that, that statement, of someone who had been the vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And according to my friend, he said, Richard, my friend said, exactly the same thing you said. Uh, yeah, they're real, they've been here for a long time, and they're a national security threat. NORAD, friends, Call them the visitors. Uh, it's just a visitor, nothing to do about it. Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut, uh, went to the Joint Chiefs, to their security liaison, to ask if a government effort was underway to monitor the phenomena in a meaningful way. And the response he got was, yes, it is. Don't ask any more questions. In other words, yes. Uh, as the general said to Alan Hynek in the Pentagon in the 70s, Alan, for heaven's sakes, do you think we would ignore something like this? Do you think we would ignore something like this? And it was an NSA analyst, someone I knew very well, close friend, and I'll never forget the way his voice sounded when he reviewed the many instances he had discussed in detail with people from sites where events had happened who came to NSA to take his classes. And he said to me, Richard, they're here. They're here. So I'm trying to make the point that after doing this for 44 years, I don't have much, uh, much question about what is going on in that limited way. These are extraterrestrial vehicles because nothing else uh, explains what's going on. Now, I want to move on. I can't cover everything I put in the slides because uh, uh, I can't. But here are some reflections from some of the Invisible College. This is to just give you an idea of some of the things we have documented. Humanoid observations, grays, dwarfs, humans, and the years in which they cluster, very similar to uh, vehicle interference cases, which cluster in exactly the same years. You can say, well, why does that? We don't know why. We don't know why. We don't know what it means to do it year by year. What does it mean to calibrate these by years when there are years and the visitors could care less how we tell time using orbits around the sun? That's how narrowly we think. Uh, we can't get at the reality of this phenomena thinking that way. Uh, here's a bigger picture of that. And... Here's an example of the types of things that are observed that we have broken down into just the most basic 164 cases that are well-documented and verifiable in terms of number of witnesses and what was observed. Okay, so 
I'll get to a few samples from the database, but before I get there, I want to read some of the reflections from my colleagues who have been working on this for much more than half a century. Uh, one, uh, Jan Ulrich is a brilliant guy, military intelligence background, and he runs Project 1947, which you can find online. It's a great repository of, play, of cases, and you should go there if you want to begin doing the work, because the work requires that you look at the cases. Look at all of the cases, read them and read them again. So when I said to him, what is going on? He said, after 50 years, honestly, I have no idea. But here's a fuller statement from a fellow who had a, I, I shouldn't use the names, but they're very high ranking in their professions, which are scientific, uh, the people I'm going to quote from. And I'm going to try to let the quote stand for itself. I said, after doing this for over half a century, after heading a scientific investigative group, uh, after using science, because you have a PhD in a branch of science, what do you think? And this is what he thinks. UFOs are physical objects that are intelligently controlled. There's no obvious form of propulsion, such as a, in a plane or a jet or a rocket or a helicopter. Although they do interact with the atmosphere, they can move through the atmosphere at extreme speeds with no obvious interaction, as evidenced by a sonic boom. There isn't any. No frictional heating in the atmosphere. There isn't any. Something else is happening, and we don't know exactly yet, certainly out here, where we do our work, what it is. The extreme accelerations that are seen, hundreds of G-forces, argue for some unusual propulsion mechanism to explain how the craft and or occupants in it could survive. The origin of these vehicles is unknown, but the most likely explanation is the extraterrestrial hypothesis for several reasons. First of all, astronomy argues in favor of this, ETH. We've already discovered he notes over 5,000 exoplanets and we're limited in what we can detect, and I already pointed out to you that that's coming. There are millions of planets in our galaxy, many inhabitable zones that could support Earth-like life, chemistry, and biology as disciplines, argue in favor of the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Water and oxygen are everywhere, and he goes on. The building blocks of life are ubiquitous in our galaxy and likely in other galaxies, and physics argue in favor of the ETH because UFOs exhibit the types of velocities that one would expect from an interstellar craft. They reach speeds upward to 40,000 miles per hour in one to two seconds and disappear from human sight. If they maintain that acceleration a few hours, they'd be traveling at the speed of light or close to it. So there is a core UFO phenomenon, the product of an advanced, presumably extraterrestrial intelligence, it can be documented instrumentally and in other ways science employs to understand how the universe works and what it contains. In other words, if we could only turn the resources of science to examining it in a partnership between civilians and military and intelligence people, we would get to it. You know, I said, my friend said they're here. Well, Bill Nelson, the head of NASA, a former senator, said when he got a security briefing, on the recent uh, events that the Navy is now reporting that resulted in those news items I mentioned, he said the hair stood up on the back of my neck. Now, come on, this is the head of NASA. He's not making stuff up just to scare people. So uh, the examples I mentioned to you, like the Minot case or the Nimitz case, which you can look up online because it's been so detailed lately, or the famous O'Hare Airport case, which I encourage you to look at. Uh, there are multiple witnesses. And at O'Hare, a visible hole was burned in the overcast. They required a powerful outburst of energy to do. So look at the best case, bet, best witness examples, and you'll see a pattern. There's a limited number, a variety of shapes. They're metallic. They fly at extraordinary speeds. They stop at a dime. They hover. They accelerate like no earthly aircraft. They make hairpin turns and dart like a hummingbird and defy gravity. Any of our aircrafts would just be destroyed trying to do that. In addition, 
They manifested this for many, many years, and we know it. And look at that chart again. You have the slides on the cluster of sightings in the past of humanoid observations. Uh, here's a, these sightings, the database that I presented to you after the humanoid sightings is 614 reports of vehicles with square windows. Uh, here's an example, third one, saucer with three square windows in the whitish glow within, they saw a slim humanoid, five or six feet tall, dressed in a one-page suit, wearing some kind of helmet with penetrating eyes. You have read about the penetrating eyes if you had explored this at all. Um, human forms were looking out. Panels of windows appear around center of the desk. Look at those 614 reports, just the examples that I gave you, and look at how many there are, and I'll be glad to provide anyone who wants it with that complete database of those reports as a beginning point for you to begin to explore some of this on your own. Uh, carrying on with the Invisible College colleagues, uh, this is a professor of science. They are their machines are here for their own reasons, and we don't have any direct data on that. They're not interested in conquest or damage. Uh, all the claims of UFO aggression are lies or hoaxes or human or mental problems. Just isn't happening. So what we're left with is, as Jan Aldrich from Project 1947, he uh, said, he quoted Cora Lorenzen, one of the early documenting uh, researchers in this field, quote, daddy does not know. The government has more and better data than it did, and it has more and better data than we do. But as far as the full story goes, we are still back in the 1940s and 1950s. But what are we going to do? Okay. Intelligent life probably exists on distant planets if we can't make contact. We know that more, more, more on exoplanets. Back to the galactic clusters, uh, there you see them. Life abounds. The universe is teeming with life. And I have talked directly to witnesses who have seen humanoid figures inside craft. And we have documented cases of humanoid figures, often smaller than we are, uh, near landed craft. You don't need a lot of those. If you see one bear, bears are real. But we have more than you would guess of those well-documented cases. I encourage you to explore them on your own because what we're going to be dealing with in the times to come are the are the certainties that we are not alone. We are not the top of the food chain. And if we're the apple of God's eye, then there are millions of apples on the tree. And it's like a sibling finding out that parents love all their kids, not just you. Uh, lots of apples on the tree. All are apples of God's eye, if you want to believe in God or see it that way. But the simple fact is uh, we're not alone. And we know we're not alone because the data has accumulated. I'm back to Lani Akea. I'm going to see if this plays. Uh, bet you it doesn't. Darn it. Didn't show up in the PDF file I wanted to use. It did in the uh, other one. But you can see uh, there's the tiny little dot where the Milky Way galaxy is. I encourage you to plug Lani Akea into the search engine and watch that brief four minute video and just contemplate what the James Webb is telling us. Uh, contemplate what you know to be true about the universe and what you know to be true about the ubiquity of life on Earth. Where it can evolve, it will evolve. So, um, there's always more to say. I had other cases I wanted to discuss. I'm going to show you a picture of the book I mentioned, UFOs in Government. 
Michael Swords, Robert Powell, some of the uh, Invisible College. I'm there because I contributed as best I could to this monumental study. You can buy it. You can buy it from me for the same Amazon price if you want uh, signed. And once again, I refer you to my website, themeworks.com. Uh, there's links to an awful lot of speeches and other things. And as I say, Mobius, a memoir, all I can do is encourage you to look at the 20 or so reviews, uh, a few at Goodreads, uh, five-star reviews all over Goodreads and Amazon by people who don't identify themselves as from DIA or CIA or NSA, but they are. And they laud how well I nailed it by virtue of my own experience working with people in intelligence and security for the past 30 years. This is a homecoming for DEF CON. It has been my psychic home for 26 years. I have spoken at this conference for 26 straight years. I made the very best, closest, deeply loved friends and colleagues from that first time on in 1996. I owe so much to this conference for illuminating the proper hacker mentality. And I will quote a talk I did when the businesses were showing up and recruiting hackers for the first time, and I was worried they would be assimilated into the economic structure, as you most of you have by now. And I said, please do not neglect the duplicity and larceny in your hearts, by which I mean the hacker modality, the hacker mentality, the never quit, the up all night, the find a way to break down the complex system until it looks like a different complex system which gives you means and access. Do all the things you need to do to make the word hacker not refer to a criminal, but to the most imaginative, creative, empowered person we have got in our midst. So that's it. That's who I am. I look forward to connecting with you if we can. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry I could not be there with you, but I'm glad I... Yet we have him here with us on the line, so we'd like to say a few words. Okay, Richard, you're live. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for showing up. I really appreciate the interest in it. Uh, for, for me, you, you know, it's been sources and resources and years of exploring and trying to pay attention to what's real and talking to people both privately and publicly. And, and so I finally decided to tell more of the truth than I ever have. It's simple. Uh, thank you for being there. Uh, I wish I could do Q&A. Uh, we don't have time. You've got my contact information. It's easy to find through my website. Uh, any questions, any concerns, just write to me or text me and I will get back to you. And uh, thank you, DEF CON. Thank you, all of you, uh, as always, uh, so much uh, for being everything this, this con has, has been for 30 years. And thank okay. you, Richard, from all of us.